Hello. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the parish's Friday Nights Live. We really miss seeing you in person, but we're happy we can still get together at Fridays at 5. I'm Alicia Longwell. I'm the Lewis B. and Dorothy Coleman Chief Curator. And firstly, I'd like to thank our most generous sponsors who make these evenings possible. Bank of America is our pre presenting sponsor, and also with um, Cor the Corcoran Group and Sandy and Stephen Pearlbinder. Now, during the course of the presentation, you will see at the bottom of your screen a Q&A, Q&A, and a space for a comment or a chat. Uh, we'd be delighted to hear from you. Those will you can type those in, and at the end of the presentation, we'll pull those up, go through them, and answer as many as we can in the time that we have. So that's a lot of fun. Um, you can do it anonymously or tell us where you're from. That would be fun too. Um, I'm sure that most of you tuning in tonight know the name Saul Steinberg very well, an artist who uh, a worldwide acclaim for giving graphic detail to the post-war of the age. Um, now, you, but you may not know now that he lived and worked here on the east end of Long Island for almost a half century in Amagansett. And in recognition of that relationship, the Saul Steinberg Foundation in New York gifted the parish with an extraordinary trove of work, over 64 pieces in all media from uh, pen and ink, watercolor, pencil, lithograph, lithography, and rarely seen in the wonderful wooden assemblages. And um, it's an example of our examples of his commercial work in wallpaper, in fact, brick as well. It's currently on view, and when we open back up, it will be there for you to see. There is also a version online. And our great thanks to the foundation and the director, Patterson Sims, for this generosity. And we are delighted to be the custodians of these beautiful works. Now, I'd love to introduce uh, our two guests this evening. I can't think of two people more fun to talk to Saul Steinberg about. And I just will say, <laughs> um, I think our uh, artist, the subject of this evening has a massive following, as you may have guessed, over 300 people have tuned in worldwide. Hello, Romania. Hello, Greenville. So a lot of people out there. Uh, uh, what would, this will be a wonderful chance for everyone to hear more about one of their favorite artists. I'd like, first of all, to introduce uh, Daniela Roman. Daniela, give us a wave there. Hi, Daniela. <laughs> who is in fact in Amagansett in the Steinberg house, which is uh, now hers. Um, she is a photographer and filmmaker known internationally and based in Paris. She is a niece of the artist and became a frequent visitor to the Amagansett house, becoming very close to her uncle after the loss of her own parents. And uh, she is also uh, close, uh, close to his across the street neighbors, who are Costantino and Ruth Novola and their children, uh, Pietro and Claire. Uh, he is, of course, the wonderful Sardinian sculptor, another immigre. There was a whole bunch of people in this uh, little corner of um, Amagansett, uh, of the East End, and a wonderful, wonderful nexus for artists. Now, Daniela with Thierry Fontaine uh, has, has made the documentary Saul Steinberg's Line, and we will see some extraordinary clips from that. Um, I just will say the full film also contains uh, some uh, wonderful footage uh, with uh, cartoonists who are making a um, talking about the influence of Steinberg and their gratitude to him. Uh, many of the cartoonists of uh, uh, Charlie Hebdo in Paris. And uh, we will see some of the film. The wonderful thing is to see Steinberg at work. Uh, also, I'd like to introduce you, Andrea, <laughs> Andrea Michalake. Thank you, Andrea. Uh, she is a PhD assistant professor of architecture at Clemson University School of Architecture. So there's a whole crowd in Greenville watching, I know. Um, uh, she has written extensively and uh, so deeply and extraordinarily on architectural design, history, and theory, and is a leading scholar in the field. She discovered a particular interest in her compatriot, uh, uh, Saul Steinberg, her fellow Romanian, and uh, who after all himself studied to be an architect. 
Uh, she is working on a manuscript, a forthcoming book, provisionally titled Boredom's Metamorphoses, Bernard Radovsky, Robert Ventura, and Saul Steinberg. Do not change the title of that. It's the most intriguing I will title not. ever. I will not, I promise. <laughs> Good. Good. Uh, so this is wonderful. Um, let's begin with an excerpt from the film. quoi c'est un maître du dessin il n'y en a pas tellement d'ailleurs il l'a élevé au rang de d'œuvre d'art c'est sûr et il n'y en a pas beaucoup qui ont fait ça explain to myself what goes on in my mind. I start with the idea of a drawing. I have the appetite to make a drawing. I have everything looking at me, paper, ink, pencil, and so on. And, and uh, I start sometimes making a hand, holding a pen, and making a drawing. This gives me time to think of what drawing this time is going to do. I also want in these moments to lose the responsibility of the drawing. It's not I who makes this drawing, it's that hand that I do who makes it. I blame it on it, but this way I have a certain freedom, uh, a certain lack of responsibility. I can always blame it on the hand that I do. Of course it's mine, it's a game, but um, I want to be sure that what I'm doing comes more uh, spontaneously, more out of my own need, um, and not out of my own uh, desire, volition, plan, and plot. Extraordinary to see him draw that line, Daniela. Well, how thrilling. Um, now we're going to go to a PowerPoint presentation. It's coming up momentarily. Um, I'm going to ask you a first few introductory slides and images, photographs that you've taken for us, if Daniela, if you would set the scene for us. And we just want to know that, unless otherwise noted, all the works that will be shown tonight, the works by Steinberg, are in the parish collection. Others are annotated uh, as to their uh, uh, collection, where they are, but to the vast majority are with us. So we'll go to the slides. Oh. Set the scene for us, uh, Daniela. Yes, that it, uh, was the house one saw after a while one sold both the house. But I just I want to say something because I want to thank the foundation for the Absolutely. website. Just the website, it's amazing. Just I advise, advise all the people to go to have a look in the website in the, of the foundation of uh, Sol Steinberg. Because in that way, I was able to understand a little more about the date because you know, 
I don't know. I remember, of course, but I don't know exactly the, the times and everything. Well, I arrived uh, the first time I, I came in the in the state. I uh, I was Seoul came to uh, pick me up at the GFK airport and he bring me directly to the house to us in the country and drove i drove by he drove by amagansett of course and i discovered the mill and the lake and the wood all this wood and i arrived in this house ready it's not exactly like that this uh, picture was took in uh, taking uh, um 68 and I arrived in 72 and it was ready with a studio, a large studio. And uh, we entered in the house and it was amazing because it was all his work and not only his work, it was with all his uh, false old work, like the clock, like the uh, imitation of uh, Mondrian, of Greece. He loved to have a lot of stuff around him. Mm, he wow. did, he made. So, uh, but it was, and after he bring me in this uh, studio and uh, it was exactly like in the picture, you can see. Yes. He used to make fabric, all his uh, work, he liked to fabric. Mm -hmm. Now, if we're talking about uh, encounters, perhaps it will be interesting for our audience to know how uh, Dana and uh, myself, how we met. So before, way before I met uh, Dana in person, I was actually doing research at the uh, Beinecke Library in the Sol Steinberg papers. And uh, I came to read the letters that Steinberg were exchanging with his family back in, in Bucharest in Romania when they're talking about the six-year-old Dana. So uh, meeting her as a child and uh, meeting her in person afterwards, that was a really, for, for me, that was a really interesting, um, a very interesting experience. And we have to thank Sheila Schwartz, the archive um, and research director of the Sol Steinberg Foundation for introducing us. And I also want to uh, extend my special thanks to Sheila for, for all the help that she's been, um, she's been giving me with my research over the past few years, so. Yeah. And second, for us at the uh, parish who have, have benefited so much from Sheila's scholarship. And I'll just make clear, I introduced Daniela, of course, by her full name, and Dana is Daniela's nickname or shortened. And name. I am French because my mother uh, flew to Paris, well, to Nice and to Paris from Romania, and my uncle came in uh, Italia and after he flew to uh, to New York, well, to the States. Yeah. So it's why I am French, it's all. Tell us about these images, Daniela. Okay, so that is uh, the peer of uh, Tino. Well, my uncle bought this house because he knew Tino, in fact, in Italia. And uh, when he arrived, he, in 42, he, of course, he was friend with him. And uh, after a while, he wanted maybe to have a house in the country. And Tino was just in front of his house. And he, he found uh, he was on sale, the little house you saw in the picture uh, was on sale. And so Saul bought. And he found a kind of family with that, with Tino, and maybe with the peer. <laughs> the peer was before. Of course, the grave, of course, the tomb. Uh, that uh, beautiful pear sculpture yeah. by Gino Nivola, yes. yes. And, yes. and, and the uh, yeah. Uh, okay. Good. So uh, we continue. So our, our, our guests have, have sort of formulated a wonderful way to look at our collection through several different lenses. And uh, Andrea, I'll ask you to tell us about these ways of looking at Saul's work. When the slides come up. <laughs> um, and really a lot goes back to the foundation of his studies in architecture, as I, as I know. 
Exactly, exactly. So I'm really excited to be talking about one of the one of my favorite topics in the world, which is Saul Steinberg and architecture. And uh, as you said earlier, it's really important to know that he was trained as an architect because most of us probably know him as an illustrator for The New Yorker. But he was much more than that. And some of the works in the collection at the parish definitely show that. But I think he's particularly relevant for architecture and not only because of his architectural, architectural representation, but perhaps first and foremost for the critical view that he has. So he's providing a type of architectural criticism without words, which is uh, something very unique, almost a whole uh, genre in itself. And I think it's also important for our audience to know that he contributed not only to The New Yorker, but to a series of very respectable and very well-known architecture magazines, as well as architecture exhibitions. So for instance, in 1946, over, this, over the span of four months, he produces drawings for the Architecture Forum, a very well-known architecture magazine. And this is one of them one of, that is part of the, part of the series. And uh, he also contributed uh, pieces to architecture exhibitions such as the Art of Modern Living or the American Pavilion for the architecture for the international um, exhibition in Brussels in 1958, whose curator, interestingly enough, was Bernard Rudofsky, also a fellow emigre and a good friend of Saul's. Yes. Yeah, so so and I'm 46 to be included in uh, one of the shows at the Museum of Modern Art, the 14 Americans alongside uh, Arthur Warke, Robert Motherwell. So he was really accepted into the modernist uh, stream, you might say, in, in America of mid, mid century architecture. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. And uh, it's interesting, we're talking about earlier, we were, we, we were wondering how can we explain the fact that he's an artist in his own right and not just a mere illustrator. And perhaps a way to explain that is to think of the difference between a joke or a punchline and a short story, right? So an illustrator mostly uh, resumes the art to a quick punchline, whether a short story requires a deeper read and reading and more investigation. So what, what Saul offers us really is short stories and even novellas. And he was actually quite interested. He, he often described himself as a writer. So someone who tells a story. And I think this is really, it's quite clear in this particular drawing that is called uh, Dublin Up that again was published in an architectural journal. And it's incredible, every, every room inside this, uh, inside this drawing tells a particular story. But perhaps what we want to, what we want to see is a spe specific relationship that are actually lacking between people who inhabit these drawings. So although they're in the same spaces, they don't interact with each other. There doesn't seem to be a true connection between them. So this theme of alienation and isolation is something that is recurrent in his in his art. And this particular drawing is also very interesting because it was taken by the French writer Georges Ferrec, and it offered the inspiration for his uh, for a short um, short story that he wrote called The Apartment Building, and also for a larger book called uh, Life of User's Manual that he published in the late 70s. Right. Uh, and once called it the writer was. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. So um, he, he referred to his art, to his uh, work as a sort of a literary work, which is quite, in quite interesting. Because uh, Le Corbusier, the famous French modern architect, also referred to himself as an author, which is what he put on his uh, business card. And Corbusier, who also knew Saul very well, wrote him a letter in which he acknowledged not only the fact that Saul was a great artist, but also the fact that his studying of architecture essentially gave him the clarity and structure of his work. So these connections with architecture are not casual and are not random. Exactly. Now, these are two examples of his maybe commercial work, you wouldn't I say, to wallpaper design. How does that relate to his greater? Uh, outlook. 
it's 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 incredibly interesting to see the the huge uh, range of art that he produced and with the variety of media which again we tend to know him mostly for his for his um illustrations drawings in the new yorker but he produced a whole a, a whole range of of art and it's interesting that the themes and the ideas are common for instance in these drawings is really intriguing to look in depth at the trains because each car tells a small story and each car is drawn almost as a container and uh, the idea uh, Tzol was fascinated with boxes from his from his early childhood, and he continued this fascination throughout his life. So oftentimes, room buildings, um, spaces, even cities become small containers. So the relationship between what is inside and what is outside a space or a person takes us to the notion of identity that we'll be discussing and looking at a little bit later. And, was there any connection with the fact that his father was fabricator of boxes, of decorative boxes, do you think? Small boxes? Uh, I th yeah, I think, uh, so his father was a, um, was making signs yeah. and he was making signs for different boxes. So for, for a very young age, he was exposed to that craft, to that technique. And I think he really exported that into his, into his art. And the, the, the drawing of the opera Paris, of the Paris opera is quite beautiful because the drawing technique itself, the line, as we saw the line at the beginning, sort of evokes the eclectic aesthetics of late 19th century architecture. Okay. We, we were talking earlier. This might look a little bit more like the Steinberg we, we know with the uh, staircase. <laughs> That's right, that's right. And, this, and the staircase was a favorite theme of his that he went back to over and over again over the years. And um, thinking about this theme of alienation and isolation, this is also what we see here, the separate islands, people that can't reach their destination, a staircase that leads to nowhere. So um, themes that he was exploring and going back to over and over again throughout his uh, throughout his life and uh, the same or a similar very similar theme we'll see in the next slide with uh, the drawings the drawing of these uh, cabins these vacation houses so returning to the idea of Saul as an architectural critic I think uh, it's the irony of the of the title of the title of the drawing Paradise, Paradise Cabins is obvious when we see all these cookie cutter cookie cutter houses that are nothing but uh, paradise looking right. So he was a he was a critique not only of American suburban developments but also of sort of the stale international style that was so prominent during mid century. I also remind us of uh, cozy cabins, a little uh, 1950s uh, motel with separate little cabins actually here in uh, Waynesco. That is exactly. Yeah. I'm against it. Exactly. Feel <laughs> it like that. Exactly. No when change. you came, right? No change. No change. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting to look at the both the the viewpoint of the drawing, which is this sort of uh, bird's eye view, right. um, also the characters and the, the the and the drawing style, which is as in most of Saul's drawing is deceptively naive. So we shouldn't we shouldn't be fooled by the sort of the simplicity of his line because they are the drawings are incredibly complex and uh, incredibly sophisticated. <laughs> That's a very good point. You're right, David. <laughs> you have to laugh at that dog. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. Dogs so they're still riding on trucks, right? <laughs> it's exactly the same now. They continue, they continue to drive with uh, their dog in the car. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah, we. Um... We are trying, I think, to move to the next slide. Yes. To sort of continue our 
our trip into into the Steinberg universe, into the Steinberg wor world. Yes. Tell us about elective affinities. <laughs> so we can't talk about Saul without talking about his personal and artistic genealogy. And genealogies are, are curious things because they are both by blood, but also by choice. So we come from somewhere, but it, we also very carefully select who we associate with. We select our friends, we select our environments, we select our personal and artistic preferences. And Saul was a perfect example of that. His uh, origin story really begins in Romania on Palace Street, which was his childhood home, his childhood street, where um, that he, and he goes back to that, to that place in time over and over again throughout his entire career. It would be interesting to say, to mention the fact that um, Saul never went back to Romania after one time in the in mid forties. However, he continued to go back in his, through his memories and through his drawings to the time of his childhood. And um, he continues, he, he asked friends and um, family who were traveling back to Romania to go to that street and take pictures and bring them back. And he used to project them on the, to project the, the slides, the photographs on the wall of his, of his uh, studio. So clearly that moment in time was in incredibly important for him, both on a personal level, but also on, a, on, an artistic, on an artistic level. And these are two renditions of Palace Street, which are not part of the exhibition. So they are in different collections. And there are only two examples of the many that he drew over the years where he goes back to that place in time, to, that, to his childhood home and his childhood street. And uh, to the left, we see the sort of curious, intriguing double parade almost, a royal parade and an architecture parade. And the characters in the royal parade most likely resemble the royal family, the Romanian royal family in the early 20th century. Mm -hmm. Whereas the, uh, the street in the, in the background is really, is his street, is Palace Street. And if we delve even deeper into, into some of the details, we'll be able to recognize under the green tree, the hovering tree, we are able to recognize the family house. And also to the right, the beginning of modern architecture in Bucharest. And in the upper right corner on the hilltop, we see the Arsenal building, which immediately gives us a clue about the location of the street. It was situated on, in a place in Bucharest called the Arsenal Hill that unfortunately was completely demolished um, in the 80s during the communist regime. So the street and the house no longer exist. They only, they only exist in his memory and his drawings. And uh, to the right, we see the, an interior scene from the house with a family of four, so mother, father, young Saul and his sister, at the, at the table. Uh, his sister, so uh, Dana's, Dana's mother, was an incredibly important figure in his life and um, very, very, an artist in her own, in her own rights, a very well-known artist. If that's Saul in the picture, lower right? The little yes, boy. That, is, yes. that is him depicted as a, as a school boy. Oh, wonderful. Indeed. That is the house. No. Speak a little louder, Dana. Yes, that you is know the house. these objects. Yes. All the objects uh, are still there, and uh, he used to to live around, surrounded by this object, mm -hmm. and you can see Sigrid. And Sigrid was uh, his companion since uh, thirty years more, maybe. even, and. Uh, he, he, when he bought the house, he, uh, he, soon after 10 years, maybe, he, he increased the space and he organized to have one space for him and for his work and one space for her. And in the middle, kitchen and the living room, where I am now, by mm -hmm. the way. And uh, is that it was a kind of uh, <laughs> uh, peace, uh, neutral land here. And each 
and uh, each of them uh, can be alone and walk and to do what they want. And uh, in the garden, it was a little, uh, it's a little motel they bought in around 70, around 70, and it's a little motel where Sigurd used to go to work. So they were in a kind of very place. And uh, to continue uh, the, the explanation of their way of life. Uh, uh, it's interesting, this, uh, this arrangement, this arrangement is not unlike the one that Frida Kahlo and Diego Rivera used to have in Mexico uh, maybe, City. Maybe, yes, it's this kind. It's, yes, it's because it was the same, maybe, I don't remember how, how long, how, the age of uh, Diego and the age of uh, Carlos. What Frida, Frida Kahlo. They, they, there was a, yeah, there was quite a significant age difference between them, but this sort of arrangement where two artists each yes, have yes, their own it is, they need space. to have their space, that is sure. And in same time, they need to be in the same uh, balance, in same tempo. And you, if you have not the same age, it's not the same tempo, maybe. <laughs> That's right. So that That's right. The, the middle of the, the, the part of uh, the middle, and you can see Sigrid, she loves to, to, to read newspaper. So it was in her favorite place, maybe. Right. Yes, with a lot of polyfiche and flowers. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's exactly like that. Huh? The spirit of the, of the house is very clear and uh, warm. So it's Aldo. On the wicker chair, and uh, you know, maybe you know, it's very interesting. The two men were very important for him. Aldo was uh, in his life since he was student, and he stayed in his life uh, till uh, '99, and so when he died, so died in 1999. Mm -hmm. And uh, he saw write a letter maybe twice or three times a month, you know, and so it's a long, uh, a long correspondence between them, long diary. And uh, Tino, Tino was uh, great for him because he introduced him Calder, for example, a lot of people very, uh, and uh, by chance I met people who passed by the house of Seoul when I spend my times, like uh, uh, <laughs> like Rudowski, as you said, and uh, it's an architect very famous, and the Kuning, of course, but as well, Paul McCartney, it was my idol when I was, uh, imagine when I was 28, and he came with his life, wife, uh, Linda, and uh, so they, it was a project of, uh, um, a cover, Paul McCartney. Cover. Yeah. Yes, the next So it was amazing. So what uh, the people around him was very popular, of course. Mm. So they um, all all these people he, with some of them he actually with some of his uh, fellow artists. He, he contributed, he worked together with them. He worked with uh, Nivola, he worked with um, Rodowski as well. He worked with Calder too, I think. And with Calder, yeah. Right, and right. he worked uh, with maybe the Kooning. I don't, uh, I don't know exactly, but... Uh... And he worked with his friend Aldo, because Aldo was a writer and he <laughs> sent the... Uh, Going so it was uh, with Bart and uh, bon, okay a lot right. of people and Aldo Butti who was an Italian writer he was also trained as an architect with uh, Saul and that's how they met also through architecture and here to the right we see a portrait of Donna beautiful. herself right beautiful <laughs> beautiful beautiful drawing yeah mm -hmm. it's El Picasso but it's okay. <laughs> 
invention. He certainly he invented his own language. There's no question. Tell us about yes. this. Yes. Yeah. He, he, he definitely invented his own language. And he liked to talk about this over and over again in interviews. And uh, he was saying that I continue, I have to reinvent my métier basically every day and that the pleasure is the invention. So, but the big question is what is the nature of invention in Saul's work? Because ultimately that is the most important question for any artist or architect. So in his case, what we're, what we're looking at is really a way of looking at the most banal and ordinary things with a continuously fresh and different eye. So something that today we'd perhaps call the object-oriented ontology, this, um, this idea of giving legitimacy to objects themselves. And in some of the drawings, we've already seen that and we'll keep seeing it. So he's fascinated with the most mundane and ordinary objects. So unlike many artists uh, who think that um, the interest lies in the extraordinary. For Saul, the interest lied in the objects and things of everyday life. And uh, it's very interesting to see how this, how this, um, this invention is manifested at the level of subject matter, so the actual subject matters of his, of his drawings, but also at the level of technique and tools. Just like an architect, he builds his tools and he, look, he uses um, drawing techniques in, uh, in very creative and innovative ways, as, as, we've, uh, as we've already seen. So um, perhaps looking at, <clears throat> excuse me, some of these examples that are on view in the exhibition, we'll see, and Alicia mentioned this um, earlier, we see, we'll see mixed media, mixed techniques, and also various assemblages. The, uh, for instance, as we, as, as we mentioned, he worked in, um, he did design for wallpaper, advertising art. He used, for him, there was no such thing as an insignificant medium. Colored pencil were as good as ink or as good as gouache or as good as watercolor. So there's nothing that is too little or too insignificant. Um, there's a very interesting theme that again, is recurrent in his, in his work, or, or rather an interesting tool, and that is the rubber stamps. So he was making his own rubber stamps. And in many cases, like we see, for instance, here in the drawing to the left, the use of the rubber stamp communicates very specific ideas about who we are as individuals or what we are missing as a society. So the use of the rubber stamps obviously makes us think about bureaucracy, and during his immigration ordeal, he definitely dealt quite a bit with that. But uh, in this particular drawings, the, the rubber stamp is what regiments us and keeps us within and inside the system. So we become identical and undifferentiated citizens. So uh, the use of, of certain techniques is entirely relevant to the content of the drawing. So there is in, there's this incredible synergy between form and content. The, we, were, uh, we were discussing uh, some time ago sort of the presence of different animals, these fantastic animals, real or imagined that are recurrent in his work. And the crocodile is definitely one of them. That little rabbit looks very scared of that crocodile. Very uh, scared. You can't very help scared. It. It's, it's a power, so it's very scary to to have the power. So the power, it's the crocodile. Yes, it is the power, and it's done. Yes, yeah, so you know, to have the power, you must kill a lot of people around you. I was wondering if he's doing this fraught immigration process. He spent uh, over a year in the Dominican Republic, I believe, waiting for his yes, visa. Yes. Correct. Right. I wonder Correct. if he saw a crocodile there because that's it's, yeah, yes. it, it's it's quite possible. It's quite possible. Okay. We'll probably have to ask Sheila Schwartz. She'll definitely know the answer to this question. That's right. That is definitely a the... power and danger, dangerous power. What about the drawing? The, uh, in fact, uh, he, he told me 
the, uh, the crocodile uh, is the symbol of the power and the administration in general okay. administration in every form. So even politics and even uh, something very simple, the administration of a country. Mm, yes, indeed. But Saint Domingue was a kind of uh, big. Uh, Right. Indeed, the administration and the bureaucracy that devour us, unfortunately, yes. And things haven't haven't changed a lot, right? No. Um, the the drawing the drawing to the right is quite intriguing, and it really illustrates what we're talking about: this idea of the everyday project, everyday everyday objects that become something else. So, starting from a simple, very simple jug. By changing scales, that jug becomes um, a tower, perhaps an architecture object, object, but also it could be like a dollop of cream or mustard, who knows, on a, on a bun. So what is fascinating is that he's inviting us to, to multiple readings. So there is no one single reading of his work. There are, and that is that is the beauty of it that uh, it continuously engages the audience in interpreting and ultimately telling telling our our own stories. Okay. The um, <clears throat> where uh, we're going to be looking at some of his, let's say, more architecture assemblages, like the one to the left where he's clearly building the tools of the architect, the ruler, the, the straight edge, and he's using the, uh, the pencil. So all of these are, all these are tools of the architects. And in many of his drawings, he depicted, he represented the drawing table of the architect. Right. Here we have, uh, again, this uh, beautiful, um, assemblage, collages, he, he, he plays with the different traditions, he picks and chooses. The tradition of found objects, obviously, in, in visual arts is an important one. So this is a, a found uh, drawing collage that he sort of appropriates and uh, reinterprets in his, in his own key. Mm -hmm. yeah. And yeah. we're moving, yes, toward <laughs> this is what this, this was a birthday present for Papoos. Papoos being one of the cats, Sigrid's beloved cat. And uh, uh, I dare say uh, Sigrid loved this more, perhaps, than Papoos, who might not have been too impressed with the birthday present. But <laughs> who wouldn't love to find that? Uh, yes. Such humor and affection and extraordinary object as you say the the uh, the object the extraordinary of the ordinary yeah, Finally, the extraordinary. And, yeah the ordinary. looking at masks and identity our final moment here we will have a clip from the film as well with uh, steinberg making a mask which is which is really wonderful it would be wonderful to see that but uh just a few words to prepare our audience so as we said, throughout his uh, immigration ordeals, he became, uh, he had to deal a lot with administration and bureaucracy. So one of the consequences, one of the artistic consequences of those moments were a series of fake diplomas and uh, fake paperwork that he's been producing over the years. And which are obviously a tongue in cheek commentary on our vanity as individuals and also our, um, Sort of desire for degrees and titles and i should probably make a confession here that uh, my husband has been contemplating the idea of printing out some of those fake diplomas to hang in his office at the university because ultimately that would perfectly serve their serve their purpose but uh, what's really behind this uh, interest in masks and and paperwork is a really deeper question a question much deeper than that who are we who are we and what really defines us? And as we will see in the, in the, in the short excerpt from the film, uh, masks not only hide, but they can also, for him at least, they also reveal specific character traits. And there couldn't be a better moment, moment to talk about masks than today. 
uh, the way we've been forced, we have been wearing masks for the past uh, for the past uh, two months, immediately makes this topic incredibly interesting. And in addition to, and, and, and uh, Saul definitely contributes to this intellectual and cultural history of the mask. And um, in the end, we're all uh, humans. And uh, I think his masks probably more than any, anything reveal the, the, how vulnerable and fragile we are as human beings, which is exactly what we've been seeing happening, we've seen happening over the past two, two months. And um, the parish has at least two um, examples of um, yeah. artwork that we have, that we have here where obviously the mask doesn't only hide, but uh, reveals something about uh, its wearer. So we could immediately imagine this sort of loud, um, gregarious woman on the left, in contrast to a quiet and uh, more subdued uh, individual to the, to the right. And uh, I think that um, prepares us for the, for the last excerpt of the film that uh, Dana and Thierry directed, yes. and we'll get, we'll get to see Saul at work making masks. Wonderful. The symmetry, the eye, my mask didn't have any eyes. No, you couldn't see out well. <clears throat> No, the nose may be too small. Yeah. No. Yeah. My mouth. <laughs> but the nose, looking out, the nose is the voice of the instinct. He looks out, he needs to be seen, and this gives a reality <clears throat> to the whole face. Well, now, I have here a few masks. I'll try them on you. The, uh, this mask here is a mask of uh, a, I call this mask the Sleeping Beauty. This is the, uh, let me see. Very nice. A uh, person <laughs> defined, a young girl defined by her shadows, She's not, she's a statue, she's a, 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 a there is a coldness and a, a lack of formation, a lack of character in herself. And this is the original mask, the mask of adolescence, the mask of uh, uh, noble adolescence, if you want, the uh, animal mask. Now, here is a mask of uh, a leering teenager who imitates comic strip characters or let me see there you go the, uh, you notice the this is an American mask <laughs> <the, laughs> okay that's wonderful oh, that, that's really extraordinary <laughs> conceals and reveals of course uh, let's look at the Q&A and see uh, if we have any questions coming in. Um, uh, Sharon asks, where exactly are the graves in the pear sculpture? I think um, uh, they're, they're in the, the, the yard there at, at Seoul. Is that right, Dana? What, excuse me? I'm sorry, did you hear the question? The question is where exactly are the graves and the pear sculpture? Uh, so in my house, in my, uh, in the garden, just in front of the house, uh, who is in Amagansett, just in front of uh, Tino house. 
So Nibola yeah. House and my house, it's in the Old Stone Highway. And someone asked, uh, how is Daniela Roman related to Saul? I mean, she is his niece. And then the question, how did she come to live in the house? It's because I inherited the house. Because I'm right. the niece, you know? Yes, the niece. She did inherit. French um, is America, I don't know why. There's a question here from Romania. Apparently, uh, he lives very uh, Julian Declaro, who lives very close to where Saul spent his childhood, a street name that I found to appear in one of his maps of the world. I've read his recently published biography in which his feelings towards his native country are depicted as negative. Uh, my question is, has this attitude been constant during his time? changed at some point uh, that's that that's an excellent question and uh it requires sort of a um a long answer so first of all the biography that was published is quite controversial and uh, the salt steinberg foundation has been publishing on the on the website of the salt steinberg foundation there is a um, document that sort of corrects makes uh corrections to the information that was presented in the biography. So not everything in the biography or other things in the biography should be taken with a grain of salt. That said, uh, it is absolutely correct to say that um, Saul had probably mixed feelings, had mixed feelings toward Romania. So on the one hand, again, he never returned, but oftentimes we do not return to places that mean so much to us that it would be too hurtful to go back. At the same time, he was always uh, he was always critical of the way Romania at the time was treating the Jewish population and uh, sort of uh, all the minorities that were in the country. So he had this throughout his entire life. He had this love hate relationship with his place of origin. While at the same time, he continued to go back in his artwork, in his memories, in his drawings. To, that, to those places. And in fact, he elaborates on this idea quite at length in some of his journal, di um, journal, journal entries, where he, he acknowledges the fact that, uh, I'm, I'm misquoting here, but the idea is that I hate that place, but all my landscapes, all my flavors, all my smells, all my memories come from there. So obviously there is a very complicated relationship that cannot be defined as black in black and white terms in that, um, in his feelings. Oh, thank you, Andrea. It's wonderful to have you be able to respond to that. That's so often the case with biographies that are published. And uh, yeah, yeah. And as, as Donna said before, so much to see on that extraordinary foundation website. You can learn everything about yes. it. Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. Now, Here's the question, what galleries represented Steinberg? Well, I know back in the 50s, both Betty Parsons and yes. Manis, and now he is represented uh, by the Pace I, Gallery. Pace Gallery, yes. Yes, sure. okay. Uh, a question from uh, Maurizio Sabini. Andrea, you mentioned Steinberg's use of many graphic tools like gouache and watercolor, expressing fields of colors, et cetera, yet the predominance of the line across the art is quite evident. What would be your interpretation for Steinberg's obsession with the line? The line. Thank you, Maurizio. That is a wonderful question. And I should probably say that uh, Maurizio is the editor of a wonderful architecture journal uh, called uh, The Plan Journal. And they also published, and he also has a personal interest in Saul's work. So uh, absolutely, the um, he has used many different media, but he always goes back to the line as I think the way I'm looking at it is in a way the origin of everything, the origin of architecture as much as it is the origin of drawing, the origin of art, and the, the amazing clip that we saw at the beginning of, the, of, the, of our conversation really shows all these different things that one simple line can be. So again, to, to pick up on what Corbusier, the Corbusier said about, about uh, Saul, that his training as an architect uh, gave him a very clear and structured and simplified 
view of the artwork, I, th I think that's what we see in his use of the line. So he's been able to not to reduce the meaning of the line, but to use it in such an elegant and um, minimal way. So, and the line can be anything. The line is a horizon line. The line is um, is a table. The line is uh, so many, so many different things. So, in a way, everything begins with a line. Great. Now, here's a, a, a comment. Will there be another book of Saul Steinberg's work alongside Aldo Buzzi in follow up to the yes. perfect egg and reflections and shadows? Yes. Yes. Another a book. book. I don't know, but it's okay. ready one. These are wonderful. Um, someone asked, where is there a link to the session to watch again or share with others? Yes, they will be posted as long as our magical victim <laughs> is able to uh, edit and put them up online. All our Friday nights live uh, as they are edited uh, go up on the website. Um, ah, from uh, Josh. I am Saul's cousin, Henny's grandson, Saul's second cousin, and was taken by the figure of the servant girl in the drawing of his childhood home. Interesting that he included the unique race class in that memory, critique of race class in the wonderful webinar. That is interesting. Do you want to speak at all to that, uh, Andrea, the young Sir, I'm afraid I didn't. I didn't. I didn't hear the question very well. Uh, the no, sound I'm, was okay. Uh, this cousin refers to the uh, servant girl in the picture of, of the childhood home, and it says, "Interesting that Steinberg included this critique of race class in that memory." And he didn't said, critique. That's a wonderful session. I, yes, he didn't yeah. critique. He was not criticizing. He was. He didn't critique. Yeah. He said just. He drew just. Uh, she was a servant and she was uh, from a uh, gypsy, so she was a little dark. And this is kind of, uh, it was there was, there, yeah, there was certainly a uh, class difference in, in Romania at the time. And uh, definitely the Roma population was um, found oftentimes in, in, in these positions. So, um, there was an interesting uh, piece, I think, by Joel Smith, where he writes about the presence of this uh, Roma girl as a servant, and he compares it with the way um, Native uh, American Native uh, American were uh, depicted at the time. So it's sort of the reddish color of the skin. So um, yeah, there's there's something here. We cannot say the, the gypsy were from Romania more than uh, Romania was from Romania. No, you. No, it's not the same thing like uh, American, Indian American, Native American, and uh, oh, okay, sure, 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 yeah, sure. Well, this this is all the comments, and uh, many congratulations to you you both for this um, wonderful. I I just it, it brings so many insights into the work and what is just so wonderful in so many levels, and it will be on view um, online, but in the galleries when we open and. Thank you, thank you, thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank, thank you. you for soul and for the conversation. Too. Right. Thank you. Thank, thank you for this invitation and the opportunity yeah. to talk about Saul yeah. and his work. An autographed copy of uh, the Metamorphosis. <laughs> Wonderful. I promise. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. At five, everyone. We'll be here. Bye. Thanks bye so bye. much. Bye. 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 Everybody. bye. Oh, okay. No. Okay. Oh. Lalo. Okay.